recent year I was in Los Angeles, and it's always wonderful National Center for the Preservation of Democracy, and I wanted to get in. Unfortunately, it turned out to be pretty noticed. Now, actually, a lot of people worry these days about the future of democracy. If we don't pay attention, we may see the last days of democracy, so we all have to do something about it. Pope Francis recently pointed out, uh, what's up with you, humanistic Europe? You're the defender of human rights, democracy, and freedom. And he called for a Europe 2.0. Now, why are we in this situation? Well, partly because some people have claimed that democracy is an outdated technology. So, democracy brought wealth, health, and happiness for billions of people, they said. Uh, but now we want to do something new, whatever that means. You know, the opposite of wealth, health, and happiness, probably. Well, the issue is that we always promised a paradise on Earth with information communication technology. They will fix it, they say, uh, and everything will be just beautiful. And then if we look into the top 10 list of most livable cities, surprisingly, we don't find any of those leading IT nations listed there. So something is wrong. If uh, it would really work so well and we want to see San Francisco there, and many other cities, and before we don't see that happen, I think we shouldn't turn the world into an ICT-driven system ruled by a super-intelligent computer. Well, so we need to talk about this hype cycle here. I think uh, we're actually beyond the peak. Um, we have to get more realistic when we talk about smart cities and smart nations. So there are certainly great opportunities, but also great risks. Well, in fact, we are now actually seeing a perfect storm, right? With cloud computing, with big data, with self-driving cars, with the Internet of Things, with cognitive computing, artificial intelligence, and also blockchain technology and all this, it all comes together at the same time. It has transformative power. We see, for example, that Uber is challenging the taxi business, Airbnb is challenging the hotel business. They don't own any cars and hotels, but they're the biggest service providers in this area. Bitcoin is challenging banks. And it's now possible to print houses with 3D printers. It's in a very short time. There's a Chinese billionaire who's built a 57-level hotel within just three weeks' time. And his ambition is to build the biggest building in the world within just a week. And most likely he will manage. We also see the spread of robotics. And that is challenging everyone, not just a particular business. It might mean the end of work for many people. The claim is about 50% of today's jobs will be gone soon. And we see, in fact, that in some countries this is already the case among young people. And that creates challenges. That creates challenges, actually, for social stability of this world. It's creating challenges not only, actually, for employees, but also for employers, for entrepreneurs. 40% of today's top 500 companies will be gone in 10 years. That's what statistics says. And it's a challenge for cities. Some cities are bankrupt, and it's a challenge for countries, too. Most industrialized countries have so high levels of debt that we don't know when they will ever pay them back. So, no wonder Günther Oettinger, who is the responsible commissioner of the European Union for Digital Issues, says, we are in a digital struggle for survival. By 2020, it will be decided, he says, who will survive and who won't. And he's probably not just talking about companies, but also about nations. So, for sure, we are now seeing a transformation of our society. Well, we are on the way of a digital society. We have seen such transformations many times, uh, like the transformation from the agricultural to the industrial society, and from there to the civil society. Now we are just about to see another transformation. 
Um, unfortunately, this transformation never very smooth and came with financial and economic crisis and also with revolutions and wars. We have seen a financial and economic crisis already. We know for sure want to see revolutions and wars, but we have to expect economic transitions maybe everywhere, right? So basically, uh, the agricultural societies of the world will transform into industrial societies, and industrial into service societies, and the service societies into digital societies. So that's probably why we see a lot of social unrest around the world. That's, of course, what uh, police is worried about, and sacred services, and politicians, and everyone else. And so the question is, is there a danger of riots? And if yes, you know, how to deal with it? And uh, one way of dealing with it recently was uh, kind of arming police. You know, and this is how it looks like. A uh, picture taken in Ferguson. And uh, you've probably followed this. So there are major social unrest. Not necessarily violent, but it is spread all over the country of the United States. And this is how it ended. Uh, to replace the police chief in order to regain trust. And a similar thing recently happened in San Francisco and probably other places too. So we really need to remember that sustainable power requires trust. And trust requires transparency. So power is given by the people to the authorities. So it's a matter of legitimacy too. Now, given all those challenges, is predictive policing the ultimate solution? We are seeing the use of such software in many cities, and certainly it's helpful for certain kinds of applications. But can we put all those people into prisons that uh, are suspicious? You know, we, we see a situation that's quite surprising that uh, the USA has most prisoners per 100,000 people in the world, not Russia, not China. And um, the question, what does it mean? Is, is that really the solution? And are the right kinds of people in prison? There is a quote of the US Attorney General, Eric Holder. He said, um, after there were uh, 45 million arrests connected with the war on drugs, certainly not supportive of drug use, but uh, the war on drugs was unsuccessful. And he said, uh, too many Americans go to too many prisons for far too long and for no truly good law enforcement reason. So is there another way of going about these kind of problems? Well, recently, the ECP has discussed things like helicopter money. Now, that's quite of absurd to many people. <coughs> but if you look uh, at another big data application, then you see this, that basically violence and deprivation are correlated. Crime and unemployment are correlated. So given that one prison inmate costs more than a PhD student, you know, uh, could we invest that money in a better way? That's the question that we should seriously think about. It. But in any way, the question is, would big data fix the world, and if so, how? So within just one minute, um, we produce 700,000 Google queries, 500,000 Facebook posts, and of course, we go shopping, we move around, all that creates data traces, and taken together, that creates real big data, right? So what can we do with it? Well, some people say it's good to fight terrorism, um, the evidence of the efficiency is not so great, actually. But there are other reasons to accumulate data, mainly business reasons. Um, of course, data is the new oil, as people say. And there's a further reason. Knowledge is power. And that's why, basically, governments, but also companies, have started to accumulate more and more data. We've read that on the newspaper. And the thinking was basically guided by Chris Anderson, at least for some time, who said, the end of theory is near. If we just have enough data, basically, the truth will reveal itself. And then we just need to do the right thing, right? So 
the idea came up, can we know everything? If you just collect enough data, could we know what is going on in the world in any place, in real time, you know, and see what, what is wrong and fix the system where it's broken? So could we build a crystal ball even? You know, that would be able to predict the world. And these are the kinds of questions that visionary people have asked and to actually uh, some companies and also militaries around the world have worked on this. And so the question comes up, would so much information allow someone to rule the world like a wise king, you know, a data-enabled way? Or a benevolent dictator? So who thinks, if that was possible, who thinks we should do this? It's always the same thing. <laughs> Very few people actually who think that should be done. And actually, a data empowered by a skin or benevolent dictator could easily make mistakes. Because this magic formula that more data automatically means more knowledge, and more knowledge means more power, and more power means more success, doesn't work in many cases. Here's an example. If you look into data, then you find all sorts of correlations. For example, number of serial killers seems to increase with chocolate consumption. You know, if that was true, it would be very dangerous to live in Switzerland, I can tell you. you know. And everyone who eats a lot of chocolate should preventively put into prison. But the point is, of course, that if you look into a big data set, then you find a lot of patterns, and most of them are not meaningful. Talking about scores correlation. So I would think you're looking into the sky, and of course, you believe to see a lot of patterns over there, but most of them don't have a scientific meaning. And we know. In fact, in science, that it's quite difficult to, to find good causal interrelationships, meaningful correlations, and it's kind of like finding a grain of gold. It's really a challenge. And classification errors will happen. Of course, everyone wants to distinguish between good and bad risk, you know, banks, insurance companies, police, uh, secret services, but unfortunately, we always have overlapping data clouds, and that means errors will happen. You know, errors of first kind, errors of second kind. It means um, situations where the alarm doesn't go off, and situations uh, where there is an alarm, but it's a false alarm. All these kind of things, and um, that's why there are way too many people on terror suspect list, and that's why it's so difficult to identify those people who would really uh, commit a terror attack, as we've seen in the past, right? We've seen other problems. Uh, so for example, in the past, you could actually make a genetic test in order to find out about your likely diseases and uh, your likely reason of death in the future. And um, that was actually forbidden by the health authorities, something that doesn't happen so often right, in the United States. So they had some good reasons to do this. And the question is, what was that reason? Well, basically, if you send your genetic material to another company and ask for their opinion, what would be your future diseases <coughs> and your cause of death, you, know, you might get a different result. Right? So we still don't know enough about big data really to do these kind of applications. It turns out even that there are some people who are absolutely healthy, it seems, even though they have terrible genetic defects. So you know, there should be real healthy deaths. So we really don't understand yet what all those data mean, and we need to be careful about it. So, Big data is not good enough. Would super intelligence maybe fix the world? Well, we're certainly seeing a very quick increase in the power of an artificial intelligence system, an exponential increase, and is expected that in about 20 years' time, super intelligent computers would exist. Some people saying it would take longer, some people saying it's just around the corner. Uh, we can't say for sure, 
Since many years, actually, computers are better chess players. And robots are better workers in many areas, right? They don't get tired, they don't complain, they don't have to pay taxes and all this. Uh, um, cars might be better drivers pretty soon. IBM's cognitive computer called Watson might be a better doctor, better in diagnosing at least diseases. And that cognitive computer is also better in answering questions, those questions at least that do have answers already. So why then are people like Elon Musk so nervous about artificial intelligence? So he said, I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. If I had to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. So why is he so nervous? And many others do. It's because some people think our society could be run by a giant machine. And like a giant machine, too. And what would it take? Well, if you wanted to do that, we would need to know where are all the components of society, how they interact, and how they can be manipulated, right? And this is work in progress. So there are companies working on this, such as Google, which wants to reprogram the state. They're working on an operating system, not just for your smartphone and your computer. They're working on an operating system for the entirety of society, not just the USA, We'll see much more than that. And also IBM is working on this, right? This campaign, IBM Watson for President, uh, it was not meant as a joke, actually. So after the automation of fabrication and of uh, driving, the automation of society seems to be next. This is what I discuss in my book, and I basically work out that there are two ways of automation, the top-down and the bottom-up way. And the question is, which is the better approach? So, but first of all, how would this approach, the top-down approach in particular, work? We would use deep learning that would run on your personal data that has been collected without your knowledge, mostly and would find out what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you can be manipulated, right? And then this kind of data is being used for personalized information, for example, personalized ads. And companies like Google make millions of experiments with us every day to find out how we can be made to look at certain pictures and click certain links and buy certain products and all this. Now, this kind of technology is also becoming more and more interesting for politics, where it's called nudging. And in combination with big data of your personal life, we're talking about big nudging. And it's so effective that you often wouldn't notice that you're being manipulated. It's possible because we are overloaded with information to guide your attention and your decision making, your information, and your behavior. So are we remotely controlled, at least to some extent? Well, if you see these kinds of pictures, you could really think so. And the science behind this is called behaviorism. It goes back to Skinner. Skinner built those Skinner boxes and put animals in there, exposed them to rewards and punishments in order to make them do certain things. That's called conditioning behavior. And exactly the same thing is now being done with us. We are the experimental animals. And the cages in which we are being kept are called filter bubbles. So basically an information world that's created around you in a personalized way. So you would feel comfortable most of the time. And you could be manipulated easily. Well, you might say, what's the problem? Doesn't hurt. You know, I like it, it's comfortable, I'm being guided, I don't have to spend a lot of thinking on all sorts of things. No, my smartphone just tells me what to do. But the problem is that we're losing our ability to innovate. It's getting more and more complicated to really think out of the box, of course, we kept in this filter bubble. And if you want to learn more about the implications of this approach, then I recommend you to read books such as The Black Box Society. 
So there are many more books now about all these kind of things. Now, you might wonder, would we also be punished as those animals in the Skinner box? And my answer is yes. Because in the end, this nudging is not as effective as you would want it to be to make you healthy and slim and to treat the environment in a good way. So one needs more effective approaches. And one of them is personalized pricing. You know, that is something that allows to reward and punish people easily. And another thing is called the citizen score. And that's already on the way in China. So everything that you do or don't do in China will get you plus or minus points. Also, whether the news that you click is in accordance with what your government wants you to think. And in the end, your score determines um, how much you would have to pay for a loan, what kind of jobs you can get, what kind of countries you can travel to, and even your love life. Because it turns out that uh, your score also depends on the people you are interacting with and uh, their scores. That brings us actually to predictive policing. Right? So we also heading towards a situation where we try to guess who might commit a crime in the future or do anything that we don't like. And in fact, um, there is now this discussion of whether prison sentencing should be based on predictions. Right? Now, remember what I said before about this genetic test. You know, if you take another algorithm in a different data set, about the same people, just a different measurement, you would get different outcomes. So this is not fair. At the moment, we don't have the um, technology to ensure fairness. And now, uh, suppose that depends also on the behavior of your neighbors, of your friends, of your colleagues, and all this, something that you cannot influence very well, then you can understand we are really in trouble because we couldn't really control our lives anymore. And there's another issue that there's a machine bias, right? So it turns out that these algorithms are disfavoring colored people and they're also discriminating women. And so to conclude this issue, just uh, I'd like to give you an example that looks a little bit like a joke, but maybe it's actually to be taken quite seriously, which is there's a very strong correlation between the number of forest fires and the number of children eating ice cream. And of course, those two things have nothing to do with each other. They're both caused by heat, yeah, outside temperature. But you know, if you would just look at correlations and do, do predictive policing, the conclusion would be we had to put those children into prison you know, for preventive reasons. Now, of course, we wouldn't do that, but we would potentially do similar things that are similar stupid. So we have to be very careful, right? Now, I'm warning of something that I'd like to ask you to take very seriously, which is our society is now at a crossroads. We will surely live in a data-based or data-driven society, but the question is what kind of society will it be? There are different possibilities, and we need to be concerned that people, including Toby there, have actually asked, is democracy that? You know, do we need something else now? And in fact, this is happening, right? Democracy is dying in Turkey, it's dying in Poland, it's not in a good condition in France, and I'm worried about a number of other countries in Europe too, and also outside of Europe. Now, what are the options? One of those options is fascism 2.0. That would be a big brother society, a brave new world society, where Maybe the leader is listening to the majority, but what the majority wants would be turned kind of in, into rules and would be very bad for minorities who would have to pay the price. Now, the issue is that there's nothing like a benevolent dictatorship. Um, 
We've seen that actually in an experiment that's known as Stanford Prison Experiment, and that was supposed to run for three weeks with a physically and psychologically healthy students. And they were split into two groups, like the prisoners and the guards. The prisoners didn't do anything wrong. But after one week, that experiment had to be stopped because it totally got out of control. And the picture that you see over here reminds you very much of Abu Ghraib, for example. Right? So if you have too much power differential, things will go wrong sooner or later. And uh, if you think, OK, what if we handed that over to an artificially intelligent system? You know, would they be smarter than humans and behave properly? The answer is no, right? And we've seen that recently. Microsoft chat got turned into an answer within just a day. So really, forget about the availability of dictatorship. It doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist in particular for one reason, that if you want to optimize the world, you need to choose a goal function. And there is no science that tells you what goal function is the right goal function. You would know later on if you made a mistake. And in many cases, mistakes are being made in the choice of goal function because the world changes, right? So that is the problem. Should it be GDP per capita or sustainability? Should it be power or peace? Should it be life expectancy or happiness? No, nobody can tell you. Everyone needs to find out himself. And that's why we have pluralism in a complex world. Pluralism hedges for the risks of unpredictable futures. It uh, makes sure that there would most likely be solutions to problems that would come up in the future. It would be somewhere. <laughs> Adversity is very important, as we'll say later on. And so why do we also need to be worried about fascism 2.0? Because diversity is being reduced by these kind of systems. Minorities are getting under pressure. And it creates a situation where basically the functionality of society and the performance of the economy go down because diversity drives innovation. It's the basis of collective intelligence and of societal resilience. That means the ability of society to cope with unexpected events. So if you reduce diversity, you will reduce innovation, collective intelligence, and resilience. And that will be very bad for your society. It will destabilize, will run into trouble, and in the end, that's the reason why those regimes always end up in wars, in a desperate attempt to stabilize again. And in fact, data support this. The most diverse economies are the most successful ones. So don't try to fight diversity. We know that biodiversity needs to be protected. Social diversity needs to be protected, too. Another option, communism to the power. Yeah, been a warning dictator. And um, yeah, and many people say, why should we run our society like China? You know? It's called the China model. And the idea is, well, it would be so much easier to build a shopping mall over here and build a city over there, you know, and uh, you know, just a few years it's done, it's there. But also, this model has its limitations, it turns out, because there are quite a few shopping malls that nobody wants to use. And those cities and smog, that means livability of these cities, is sometimes quite poor. Financial meltdowns and all these kind of things. So it doesn't seem to be the perfect system as well, right? Now, it might seem an appealing idea to some to be able to remotely control what everyone is doing. And uh, there might be reasons uh, to do such a thing. So for example, if somebody has a choice between an apple and a muffin, you well, should uh, people say, tempt that person to eat an apple. That's the nudging idea, right? <coughs> Well, unfortunately, it doesn't always work well. You know, I almost died of an apple one day. 
and there's the, the course of an allergic reaction, right? Now, if you go to a doctor, the doctor would probably tell you, you should eat nuts, because nuts are very healthy. But I'm sure among you, there are some people who can't eat nuts and would be dangerous even to do this. You know, it could really seriously affect their health or be even deadly. And if you look back into the literature about health advice, then you would see that this has changed dramatically over the years, and all of that was based on scientific evidence. So you know, we should really be careful if now our health insurance tries to tell us how we should live. We are all different, and this is very important to realize, and that's actually why we are now talking about personalized medicine. This idea that um, uh, being a Bolden dictator would tell everyone what would be your place and what you should be doing, this is misguided. And I'm telling you why. Because all the time when you would do something different, like you do something on Wednesday rather than Tuesday, or on Monday rather than uh, Tuesday, you get minus points, right? Because it's a deviation. But that basically takes away all that combinatorial opportunities that we would have. So suppose we are living in a situation of crisis, you know, an era, era of scarcity of resources. And somebody among your friends would marry and you would really have to bake a cake, right? Now, unfortunately, you get flour on Monday, raisins on Tuesday, berries on Wednesday, uh, and this is basically, all of that will be rationed, and uh, all of that will be dictated from above, and your friends will get it on different days, and so on, and so on. So we'll never be able to bake a cake. And that's why we have actually black markets in such kind of historical situations in order to regain this combinatorial opportunities that you can do so many things as soon as you start deviating from a pattern. So we should really not reduce the freedom because also freedom promotes creativity and innovation. They are clearly support that. Now, next model is feudalism 2.0. Surveillance capitalism, a few companies that would basically start to rule the world globally if possible. Yeah? And in fact, uh, a company like Google has quite some reach, as you can see over here. So it's dominating um, search queries in uh, half of the world. And that uh, happens to be also the countries actually that are part of the future TISA agreement. So, that would be maybe a precondition to remotely control the Western world, right? So we should be, really be thinking twice about such kind of things. Now, this is again turning into a top-down dictatorship, this time by companies, right? Um, or institutions. So we are already seeing that some universities are forcing students to wear Fitbits and punish them if they don't exercise enough. You know? And so, your employer would do such a thing, your health insurance would do such a thing, your car insurance would do such a thing, um, and your um, shop where you buy things would do such kind of thing. So then really we would be scored all the time and uh, we would always be steered by, by those scores and that basically means that things would get very seriously for example, companies would want you to drink certain kind of sweet drinks, right? So that's kind of the personalized nudging that would be employed to make you buy certain kind of products. But on the other hand, your health insurance would be amused and uh, would want you to stop this. And so you would get a uh, citizen score minus points if you drink these things. So basically what happens is you are being pushed from all sorts of sides and um, that's certainly not good for us. Just compare that actually with another complex system. I mean, both society and our body are complex systems, right? Uh, we know if we want to cure 
a disease, then we need to find the right kind of medicine, we need to uh, take the right dose at the right time. There could be interaction effects between different medicines and so on. So if you do this, it would surely make you more ill than you are because of all those interaction effects. And in fact, the same happens with all the nudges that are trying to make society certain, uh, uh, trying to make us uh, let us do certain kind of things. So it's like you're sitting with your family in front of the TV screen and you can't agree on the program to watch. So basically, uh, father is choosing the program. But there are other people who have a remote control too. So you know, it's going to be switched back and forth all the time. And this is the outcome, right? A huge conflict. Everyone is kind of pushing into a different kind of direction. And this is about how our society feels today. A lot of polarization is going on. And it's also seen in scientific data. It's a side effect of those bitter bubbles and these steady attempts to uh, nudge people and uh, to try to make, uh, let them do certain kind of things. So I would warn of this because I think we might lose everything that was really important for us, everything that we built over hundreds of years, like freedom, human dignity, assumed innocence, fairness and justice the right to, to pursue our own happiness, pluralism, democracy, and a lot more. And besides, there is really powerful technology, you know, uh, terrorists and organized criminals would be the first ones who would want to get hold of them, use them for their own purposes. And in fact, uh, it's worrying that they often succeed. Cybercrime is exploding exponentially, it costs uh, $3 trillion dollars a year, and we know that basically everyone has been hacked so far, including the US military, the White House, the Pentagon, and so on. So you know, sooner or later, such a machine uh, would be able to steer society, would be hacked, and get into the hands of wrong people. And that's why I'm saying stop. Uh, we can't let this happen. And anyway, I think we need a new understanding of our digital future, and the point is that, yeah, in fact, we have more and more processing power, it doubles every 18 months, it's more slow, but data volume increases even faster. The green curve overtakes, doubles every 12 months, that means within just one year we produce as much data as in the entire history of humankind, all the years before. It's hard to imagine, but it implies that basically all the processing power we have is not enough to process all the data we have. In fact, we can process a smaller and smaller percentage of data, and that's why we need to know what data we need to process. That means science again, right? But there's something else that happens. As we go on to networking the world, complexity is increasing combinatorially, and that's even faster than exponentially. So that implies a lot of top-down control sooner or later. And if you listen to this year's World Economic Forum discussion, then you could really conclude we are already living in that world where we lost, basically, top-down control. Fortunately, there is an alternative control paradigm, distributed control, and we'll talk about that later. It's true. I mean, our behavior can be predicted to some extent. Companies like the Cordial Future claim even to 90% of the time. But interaction changes everything. You know this. You know, one day you fall in love with somebody, and that will change your life. And you're influential enough, then it might change the life of people in a company or a nation. And so that's why society cannot be steered like a car. Interaction creates undesirable outcomes or desirable ones. In this case, it creates. Uh, Phantom traffic jams. Now, people have all the data they need. Now, good technology, they're well educated, they all have a driver's license. Nobody wants this to happen. But it happens. And even if you would be able to read the thoughts of all people, it couldn't prevent those traffic jams. Now, the reason is that this is a phenomenon called systemic instability. 
And as a result, small variations will amplify and will create a cascade effect, which finally lets the system get out of control. And in fact, uh, we can certainly say that even though the Silicon Valley and, and other places have created really astonishing progress in terms of technology, our biggest problems have still not been solved, like climate change, the financial crisis, conflict and war in the world, or this lack of sustainability, you know, the resource shortages that we're running into. We haven't found solutions for this. We need to have another approach, right? The big unsolved problems of the world actually result from complexity. We need to understand that we, we had a totally wrong approach and of systemic instability. And examples for this are unstable supply chains and also booms and recessions. I mean, world economic instability, crowd disasters, um, crime. You can also see oscillations here, that means instability. Tragedies of the commons, such as overfishing. Um, here, cooperation would be good for everyone, but just as this free traffic flow in a circle is just not stable, and that's why we end up in tragedies of the commons. Uh, in many cases, conflicts, also revolutions, all of that are examples of systemic instability, and this is what we need to pay attention to. We need to understand how these phenomena come about. In many cases, uh, local perturbation, and sometimes a very small one, an unnoticeable small even, might create a cascading effect that messes up the entire system, right? And sometimes it's the entire world, in fact. As we've seen for the world, financial crisis where the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers actually caused a lot of other bankruptcies of hundreds of banks and it caused losses of hundreds of billions of dollars. Or take this cascading effect that extended over many different sectors and many years in fact, like started with September 11 and as a result uh, the wars on Afghanistan and Iraq were started but they didn't play out as expected. Instead, uh, international tension spread. Now we have problems in all sorts of countries, such as Syria, for example, we created uh, international terror, uh, which scares people, and a refugee crisis. So all of that is interconnected. It's a massive cascading effect. And what worries me is that we haven't yet managed to stop this cascading effect. So you know, in the worst case, that we could end in a war, a global war. So it's really time for a change. We need to realize the problems of the world are complex, and we need a new approach. Albert Einstein said we cannot solve our problems with the same kind of thinking that created them. And one of the things we need to do urgently is to create a resilient society. And so what do we have to do? Well, basically the same thing that Alexander the Great did with that Gordian knot, which is cutting it into pieces, right? And that basically requires engineered breaking points, as we have that in our electricity network at home, in fact, right? Just not in the financial system, not in other systems. It requires us to engage in decentralization and modular design and distributed control. Yeah, subsidiarity, for example. It's important to realize that the more complex the system is, if we want to achieve our goals um, efficiently, then we need to give more autonomy to components of the system. And fortunately, there is actually a new approach which is compatible with self-determination with democracy, with free entrepreneurship, and that is distributed data, storage and control, combined with our organization. And in fact, well, there is empirical evidence. Elinor Ostrom, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, found that self-governance is efficient if you just have the right design principles. And how could you support the self-governance in a distributed way well, digital assistants are the answer. 
So take the root guidance system. You know, here it's not a centralized machine that basically tells everyone what to do. You, you can turn this on and off. You choose your goal. Then your visual assistant gives you some choices, like uh, minimize travel time or distance or greenhouse gases. And you choose. You have this freedom of choice. Then again, the digital assistant helps you to achieve your goal in the most efficient way. So I think this is the way to go. As long as these devices don't cheat us, uh, we'd we'll be very happy to, to use them more and more. So the point is really to go away from this 20th century top-down management of complex system towards a system that has a stronger bottom-up involvement. So where people can engage that it needs to go from the paradigm of power to the paradigm of empowerment. And in fact, we had a hackathon in San Francisco about the big one, the big earthquake that's expected. And people came up with decentralized solutions. I was very astonished about this. So Amigo Cloud, for example, created an app that allows you to take a picture of a broken bridge or damaged building and annotate that. And as soon as there's connectivity, that information will be uploaded and would be available for police and first aid and for everyone else, like the citizens in the neighborhood too. Now, um, of course, sooner or later you run out of battery, electricity might be down, so you need to have this charge beacon, um, basically solar panels, Again, distributed in the neighborhood uh, that allows you to charge your smartphone. Then you need to have uh, a hot networking possibility between the smartphones as the telecommunication network is otherwise down. And you need to have uh, helping hands, um, a sharing economy platform that allows people to say, oh, I I'm in trouble. You know, can somebody provide me some water or some food for my child or help me to take care of my grandfather who is ill. And then others in the neighborhood could say, oh, I'm happy to help. You now, of course, actually in a crisis situation, many people are willing to help. So you just need the tools to help yourself, to help others, to help each other. And in fact, digital assistance can help us to um, gain situational awareness and interact more successfully with each other. Now, I'd also like to point out that we really need democracy to the power. Um, a digital democracy that enables collective intelligence because the world is so complex, nobody can really understand it fully by herself or himself. So we need to create platforms that allow us to share our knowledge and our ideas and also use um, artificial intelligence system and bring it all together in a symbiotic way and in fact, uh, that requires online de deliberation platforms where everyone could put their ideas, their arguments on the table, and they would be sorted in this virtual environment so that uh, in the end there would be a number of different perspectives on the problem. And once this has been sorted out, people would sit around a round table, some representatives of these different perspectives, to try to get those perspectives on, under one roof. And that means to come up with integrated solutions uh, that satisfy many different needs and create opportunities for many people. And we can say that the secret success principle of collective intelligence is that not the best individual solution wins. It's really the combination of solutions. I mean, it requires diversity. Diversity is an asset. And that's why we should also start really to identify the success principles of all the countries in the world. There's thousands of them. If we make that explicit, we can learn to combine those success principles in new ways. So this is basically what uh, digital democracy is about, um, really making the best out of the diversity that we have of all those ideas and also make sure that we engage in value pluralism because that creates multifunctionality, not just the optimization of a single quantity. And finally, we also need to have the economy for Dutch O, or which I also call capitalism 2.0. 
and it would be a liberal, democratic, participatory, social, and ecological system. Now, you might wonder, how, how is it possible, really, to kind of unify those different principles who were almost enemies in the past? Well, I will tell you, but uh, first of all, it's really important that we learn to do this, because otherwise we'll really run into trouble. I told you about the unsustainability problem, and that we will run into serious resource shortages in the future. If you want to avoid this, we need to build, finally, this circular economy that we, we've been talking about for so many years and didn't succeed. The only thing that really made progress is sharing economy. That's certainly an important part, actually, of the solution. But there is more to it. So we need to map resources and to use them. We can do that now in a crowdsourced way. We started to build a simple app for this. Um, certainly needs to be extended. Hopefully, some of you will get excited and help us with this. But the question is now: How can we turn this downward spiral that we see in many? The areas of the world, all those problems that get worse and worse, how can we turn that into an upward spiral? And that requires basically a multi dimensional incentive in the work system, a multi dimensional money. And how would we create it? Well, basically, we would start measuring with the Internet of Things all those externalities that matter. That means external effects of interaction between people, between companies, companies, environment, people, environment. We have measured this. It's now possible, finally, with the Internet of Things. And uh, we would give a value or a price to all those externalities. And then a platform, a new incentive platform, or if you want uh, this financial system for that, oh, that would allow us to create the incentives to support the organization of complex systems and all, even the self-organization. And as you, all of us, actually uh, measure externalities and provide data to others, you would create value, you would earn some money, you would actually earn different kinds of money depending on whether you measure things, uh, externalities that are important for environment or for social issues or whatever. So that would be different dimensions, you would earn different kinds of currencies and we would create money in a bottom-up way rather than what the uh, ECB is now that we've been pumping billions of dollars in a top-down way into the system and doesn't do the trick. So let's do, uh, try something new that's like Bitcoin. We can now create money in a bottom-up way and would then rise to the top. It would flow by everyone. Everyone would benefit. We could water this digital desert that we have today in Europe and turn it into a digital rainforest. It means an ecosystem that has abundance and diversity. So it's really important to understand that we now need to build an information innovation production and service ecosystem where those products and services that exist can be combined to build new products and services that requires just interoperability, then that will unleash combinatorial innovation and all the jobs that we need. But that requires open data, right? Open data is needed anyway to support better decisions, digital democracy, participation, new jobs, that means the digital economy, and so on, has a lot of value. Yeah, 3,000 to 5,000 billion dollars a year. That means that uh, is quite some money, and we could all benefit from this. If we just built a new real-time open data source, and we started to do this, the system is called NervousNet. We invited to participate in the creation of this system, because it's open source, it's uh, participatory. And what it does is basically it allows you to turn your smartphone into a measurement device. It has about 15 sensors. You can measure noise, light, location, all sorts of things. And we could co connect our smartphones to build a global measurement system. The only thing that is really important, I believe, for us is that we would build a system that we can trust, right? And that's why we, it should be built a citizen as a citizen web, um, built and managed by the citizens, and there should be informational self-control. I mean, you should decide which sensors to open, whether you want to use the data just for yourself, 
like for a smart home application or when you want to share these data, you are in control and would be a participatory system, a system that creates new opportunities for everyone and therefore benefits for um, for businesses, for cities, and for entire societies. There would be three levels of engagement. Data production in a crowdsourced way, data analytics, and the possibility to build your own Internet of Things apps. And then this system can do a lot of things for us. Um, Real-time measurement, trade awareness, and kind of advanced science and also supports organizing system and collective intelligence. So, for example, we can measure noise, we can collectively measure earthquakes, we can measure things that we can't see, hear, and feel, such as social capital, reputation, trust, solidarity, and all these kind of things. Um, we can map crisis together, but uh, even more fascinating is this possibility that we can get real-time feedback to support self-organization. That means 300 years after the invention of this concept of the invisible hand, we can now finally make it work by combining the Internet of Things with complexity science. So the trick is to create the right kinds of feedbacks in the system that can be done with that multidimensional incentive system that I mentioned before, right? And then you could also come up with multi-level coordination from a unit of a company to the entire company globally and uh, also from a quarter of the city to an entire society. And in this way it's possible to get rid of traffic jams just by changing the interaction mechanism between cars slightly with automatic driving. Uh, we've shown this and it's also possible actually to outcompete centralized traffic control in cities with a local coordination mechanism that is a decentralized approach that would create green waves by self-organization and create benefits for everyone. So uh, that means shorter travel times and benefits for the environment too. And these kind of decentralized approaches become more and more important also in electricity grids like smart grids and in production under the keyword industry 4.0. So, I'm summarizing. I am convinced that if we go on as before, we may end in disaster, characterized by loss of democracy, freedom, by mass unemployment, financial and economic collapse, resource shortages, serious climate change, global warm. Silver intelligence can certainly help in certain areas and issues, but it cannot prevent all this. It requires a digitally upgraded socioeconomic system. And that's what I was explaining to you. The future of our society and economy is not a top-down controlled system that runs like a clockwork, like a giant clockwork, but it's a network, well-coordinated, distributed system of largely autonomous systems. And yes, if you want to build better systems in a better future, then big data, yes, but open, participatory and fair. Artificial intelligence, yes, but symbiotic and ethical. Incentive systems, yes, but multidimensional. And an operating system for society, okay, but with creative bottom-up opportunities, self-organization, self-organization, coordination, and a socio-ecological capitalism based on the finance system for the, oh, combining the internet of things with fintech, that means blockchain technology, for example, and complexity science. And that means, basically, we combine smart technologies with smart citizens, that enable citizens, empower citizens with information, with good education. Now, this creates smarter cities and smarter nations. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Um, questions? Okay. Okay. No. Oh, right. Waiting for a speak. Uh, want to take that one? Yeah. yeah.
Uh, yeah, what about smarter man? Can you say something about that? About what? Smarter man kind. So we know we say smarter cities, better technology, everything else improving perhaps, but what about mankind? Right. So um, I think we have had in the past years a pretty technocratic vision of smart societies and smart nations, and we are just about to discover that this is not creating the livable citizen societies that uh, we were dreaming of, and what we need to do now is to move on from the first phase of digitalization to the second phase. Right? The first phase characterized by big data and artificial intelligence and top-down optimization and control towards a second phase where the Internet of Things, uh, decentralized approaches uh, like blockchain technologies, um, complexity designs and so on, are used in order to enable participation and collective intelligence and uh, collaboration and, and all this. So uh, now we need to add the bottom-up component also to create a better equilibrium, uh, a better balance of, of forces and of interests in, in society, because otherwise it won't work well. So we need to get the citizens back into the system, into the loop. Um, our intelligence, our ideas, our creativity and innovation. Now, of course, as we open up information systems, we also need to take into account that not everyone is well intended, as we know. Uh, there can be always a few troublemakers, and that uh, might be making quite a bit of trouble. So, what it takes, therefore, is that we would also have suitable mechanisms in those social technology platforms that uh, we would have to build, social mechanisms that create social order, uh, collaboration, and, and these kind of things by self organization And from evolutionary games theory, for example, we know a number of mechanisms that are supporting cooperation in a self-organized way. So, it requires certain kind of mechanisms to induce, to incentivize responsible behavior. And among those mechanisms are, for example, reputation systems. Um, I would actually extend the reputation system of the day by a number of features that we don't have at the moment, but it would take too much time to go into details. And also qualification systems, right? So uh, whenever we have people work in a high-risk environment, they need to qualify, they need to know about the risk, but also they need to show that they're acting in a responsible way, right? And we do that with qualification systems, uh, filtering systems in a sense, right? And we could build that also into those uh, social platforms, in fact. So imagine that the beginner just has access to a limited amount of data and functionality of these participator platforms. And if you want to have access to more data and more functionality, you know, they have to qualify. Yeah? And in this way, basically, the, the more power they get to do things with data, the more they have, would have to be qualified and the more responsible they would have to behave in order to get access to that large amount of data and functionality. I think in this way, we can create more open but well-behaved um, information platforms. And uh, this is what we should do. I think that's often lacking today in the social media platforms. That's why we have all these problems with hate speech and um, fame wars and uh, shitstorms and, <laughs> and so on. No, uh, yeah. These platforms lack the right kind of mechanisms to create social order in a self-organized way. And we need to build them. Uh, sorry, there was a question here. Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask that. So do we, do we already have the, like, the mathematics and the, some of the physics and the uh, computational science tools to actually achieve already what you want? Or do we actually need to develop something new? Uh, and if that is so, uh, that makes it quite a leading question, but if so, where, where should we actually be thinking of developing new tools? 
I do think that actually by now we have the insights required to get this process started to build those platforms that we so desperately need in order to really make this loop forward into a better digital society that uh, creates opportunities for everyone and creates also again a rising economy and optimism in our society and all this, right? So we need to get that started pretty soon. And the knowledge is there for this. Uh, it's not worked out in all the details, you know, in the sense that it's written up and I could hand that over to somebody else uh, or a team of a uh, hundred or a thousand people programming it and putting it into a code, right? Um, it's not elaborated to, to that level of detail. So that level of detail needs to be you know, developed as we go on, and in particular also by involvement of uh, knowledgeable people. And this community certainly could contribute to this, right? So I don't think we would uh, be able to do all that at uh, ETH Zurich ourselves, you know, and we didn't even want to do that, because I think it's important that even the creation of that platform is a participatory process, or a lot of ideas of a lot of people feed in uh, and with different stakeholders. So it would really work in the end for everyone. It's time for one more question. Yeah. The, the internet has an inherent capability for a huge amount of decentralization, but it ha has done for a very long time. But we haven't seen that, really. And, I, uh, and what I mean by that is that we could have all had all our data privately on our own servers, in our own houses, maybe backed up with the friends, distributed to each other. But we gave into something which is essentially, uh, we like a free lunch, we like free services provided conveniently by a centralized, centralized service provider. And how would you resist in a decentralized world that human tendency at Haber of work for a free management of something rather than paying for something and taking responsibility for it yourself? And if you couldn't, what would the effects of that centralization, that market centralization, be? Yeah, that's a difficult one. Uh, obviously, it's like this that um, it's easier to make uh, quick progress if you don't care so much about privacy and security and decentralization and all these kinds of things. And that's why we're now in so much trouble, right? So. What might happen is that we'll see an economic or societal scale accident or we'll pay a high price for that, right? We've seen the financial meltdown in 2008, a similar thing could happen with our information society, right? Um, so it's really time to work out um, alternatives uh, to have a backup system, a uh, plan B, um, something complementary. I think it's about my, my time to do that. And I think there are enough people who would understand this is necessary. Uh, we're not talking about certain kind of disasters that might happen, but that people are now paying more and more attention to, like. Uh, blackout of electricity system for a longer time period as that could happen if there is a solar storm hitting the earth or an EMP attack or whatever. Also, some people think the internet could be down for some time or Google could not provide a service to Europe for some time. You know, we cannot force them to do that. You know, all of these kind of things could happen. Um, and we need to have a backup plan. And uh, that backup plan uh, really favors resilient and decentralized system. So I think it's a matter of civil defense and, and preparedness to to build the, those systems. And uh, most likely, governments uh, should feel responsible to get that on the way. But also, even if that hasn't happened to the extent so far, people can just getting started. Like WhatsApp has been created by 40 people, right? And now being used by a billion people. Um, take Wikipedia, it has basically replaced um, Encyclopedia Britannica, right? Which is a kind of centralized system. 
not everyone is writing articles for Wikipedia, but it's uh, being used by almost everyone, and it works pretty well. Not perfectly, but pretty well. OpenStreetMap, uh, invented at UCL, if I remember right, um, became a tremendous success story. It's uh, being supported by 1.5 million people who feed in data. That's enormous, right? So now the next step is to build those decentralized participatory sharing economy platforms, right? And that's what we should do now. Okay, let's uh, thank Dirk again.